Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, great to be here. I don't know, I'm not actually sure the best place to stand. Maybe I'll stand uh, on this side. Um, my name is, is Eric Termondi. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur for about four years now. And um, my, my story starts in university. I went to school at the University of Calgary in Alberta. And um, when I was finished school, uh, I, and ultimately, I became the vice president of the University of Calgary. I had a budget of $18 million. I was responsible for the finances of 25,000 students. Um, I ended up being a class ambassador, and I had a, a ton of extracurricular experience, really, outside of, outside of the classroom. But then when I went to apply for a job, I did the same thing most people do. I applied to 60 different jobs. I changed one line in my cover letter, and I didn't get any opportunities to have a job. And uh, it was my fault for not really doing the research, not really understanding who I was, not really understanding what the companies were looking for. But ultimately, I left university with a, with a ton of experience and education. I had my, my degree and no job prospects. So then I started looking around, and, I, and there was this interesting conversation that was going around at the time around, around millennials, around co-working spaces, around remote working around this whole evolution and notion of work that ultimately we were all collectively trying to understand a little bit better. And so what we set out to do is to understand, okay, now how can we help organizations attract and retain talent is what it came down to. How can we help companies understand what their experiences are so that they can tell the right story to attract the right people? And I think we can agree, you know, I know there's a lot of work being done here around values and we stand for and the experiences that we're looking for and I think so often I think, I think we're lucky in this room to get a head start on that because so often I think we work really hard to be something that we're not so that we can make somebody else happy about our successes right and so as a result what we did is we, we built a, a tool a survey based tool that quantified workplace culture so we're putting numbers behind experiences okay so let's just say for example we are an accountant all of us are different accountants uh, I might be at Starbucks, at Lululemon, at Aritzia, at PwC, at Deloitte, at MEC, for the government, for the city of Vancouver. And the job that we're doing as an accountant is very similar, but the life that we live as a result of that job might be vastly different, right? And the problem, too, is that when we look at the mission, vision, values of these companies, a lot of them will say, you know, we value integrity, honor, respect hardworking, motivated, driven, highly communicative team players that are willing to get the job done, right? We see this everywhere. And so the challenge was, is how do we actually differentiate what these companies are in terms of their experience so that they can attract the right people and keep them? Not just based on their values, but based on the experience that they get while they're in the job. We worked with some pretty interesting clients. We worked with the, with the Bank of England. We worked with BC government. We worked with post-secondary institutions. We worked down in the United States. And we started to find that this whole idea, this whole conversation of work, it needed a bit of a, a facelift, so to speak. It needed, we needed to talk about it in a new way because it doesn't really matter what industry we're in, it doesn't matter what sector we're in. Every time we look on Monday morning, everyone's dragging their feet to work, right? And on, on Wednesday, we, we post it's hump day, we're halfway there. And on, so, on Friday, we celebrate as we skip into the weekend, right? That's pretty much what it looks like. It doesn't matter what industry or sector we're in. And so I thought, you know, maybe we need to look at this whole idea of work a little bit different. We're entering an age where the world is moving faster than it ever has before, and still we're not talking about that thing we do more than anything else in a day, which is work, positively. Now, I'm not saying work is about beer kegs and ping pong tables and dogs running around. I'm talking about the experience here. Right? What is the experience that we have while we're at work? And so we set out to really fix that or understand it so that we can help organizations um, really tell a better story. So following the creation of that company, I wrote a book, it's called Rethink Work, again, designed to remove that negative connotation associated with work. I did 40 presentations to various clients and various industry associations, ended up getting signed by a speaking bureau here in Canada. Uh, fast forward three years, I've done about 200 events now. This was. I mean, 50, 60 of them are, are this year. I've got 24 in the next three months all over North America. So I'm spending about 150 days on the road. This year I'll have about 80 flights and just kind of on the road talking about this to numerous industry associations, to numerous companies. 
And the findings of the work that we did, and this conversation around work, I think are really interesting, and that's what I want to share with you today. The first question is, what, what if we've lost sight of basic human wants and needs in the wake of new technology? I mean, I think we can agree that the world is moving faster than it ever has before, from the devices that are in our pockets to the ones that we're typing on, uh, to even how we communicate and how we transport ourselves. What happens if we actually lose the sense of, of human connectivity in the wake of that? What if we revolutionize the job description? So not just, I know there are a lot of entrepreneurs here, I know there are people who are looking for jobs. What if we revolutionize the job description from both sides? What if the companies were telling a different story? And what if we knew ourselves a little bit different so that we knew better questions to ask? Right? I really want to get into this today too. What if we could bypass a looming loneliness epidemic? The World Economic Forum is now saying that we are more alone than we ever have been before. Is this because of the technology? Is this because of the amount of devices that we're connected to? Is this due to the speed of the world is moving? This is what I want to talk about today. And what if work is something we like to do? That's ultimately the goal that I'm trying to get across here because if we like the work that we do, it would seem a lot more effortless, right? The, the family life that we would have at home would be better, our relationship with our friends would be better because we wouldn't be drained. I know we talked about, um, what was the term that you used? In terms energy of inventory. Yeah, your energy inventory. And I know that when work is something that we don't like to do and we're doing it eight hours a day, it's really hard to come home with a lot of energy, right? So what we want to do is get our energy inventory A's across the board. And that doesn't come from perks necessarily at work. It comes from that experience. And everyone in here has a skill set and an experience desire that's matched with an employer that's here or can offer that experience to somebody who's looking for it also here. So finally, what if diversity and inclusion wasn't enough? I think we've been talking about diversity and inclusion in the workplace for a long time now, and I want to challenge that notion of diversity and inclusion being enough and really dive into that a little bit further. So this is sort of what I want to talk about today. Is there, is there anything else that, that you know, any, anything that's burning or anything that somebody really wants to talk about uh, today when it comes to the, the notion of work? Yeah, the, the creation of belonging. So the belonging? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like how? I'm curious about how really to connect to belonging. Sure. To you, and that, how that connection happens and you need time and trust and how that sure. arises in the Yeah. The one, one thing, this is just my personal observation, especially uh, about Vancouver. I was talking, talking about this with somebody uh, earlier today. Is that Vancouver is, can we agree, a little bit difficult to break into, perhaps? I mean, what I found about Vancouver is Vancouver is one of the very few cities that doesn't network for the sake of networking. Uh, a lot of bigger cities will go out, and maybe we'll have a drink, or we'll go over, out for dinner, and we'll just meet new people. You can re reach over here, or look over the book, and then say hi. You know, I'm, I, was, I was talking about this, you know, in a 33rd story, 33 story building in Vancouver, it's very rare for people to even look up. In other cities, you know, you're invited over for dinner by the time you get to the 33rd floor, and I think that's a difference. But one of the things that I've found about Vancouver is when you're really intentional about the things that you like to do, maybe it's paddleboarding, maybe it's yoga, maybe it's you're a foodie, maybe you like to you know, try new bars and new restaurants, uh, the community is very welcoming in, in doing the things that you really like to do if you're intentional about that. Maybe you like to dance, maybe you're a salsa dancer. The community here is really welcoming and open when you know really what you like to do. At the same time, in my experience, maybe this is just my personal experience, uh, when you sort of just you know dip your toe in the water and test new things, you know people really have this community set. So I would say if you if you really love something, if you're really into something, go in, dive in, and people, at least in my experience, have been very welcoming uh, to do that. But I think that talking about that belonging is something that I really want to to get into today. Um, going back to the notion of work, I think we've seen this incredible evolution in the idea of work. Just less than 300 years ago. Um, 98% of the population was involved in the production or the harvesting of food. Fast forward to the year 2000, only 2 to 3% of the world is involved in the, in the production or harvesting of food, yet we produce more food than we ever have before. The technological advancements in the last three years have not been incremental, they've been exponential. And we're just entering an era now where the World, uh, world Economic Forum has said we're entering the fourth industrial revolution, one where we're moving leaps faster than it was slower. And so when I talk when I talk about this 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 change now, we're seeing this this change in the idea and the technology associated with work. Really what I like to talk about is how do actually how do people fit into this conversation? How do we look at is there anyone familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? So we're we're almost all familiar, but basically Maslow 
has, has set, set out what, are, what we essentially need to be fulfilled. At the base of this triangle is biological and physical needs. So, right, do we have food, shelter, water? If we do have that, we can survive at the very least. Following that is safety, emotional, uh, physical safety, psychological safety, that comes next. And then third becomes a, a, the sense of belongingness and love. The following that comes esteem, esteem needs and, and self-actualization. And really what I like to talk about is this sort of belongingness and love because I think that's where we're compromised most. We see this incredible evolution and increase in technology that actually is cr potentially creating this more lonely environment than we've ever seen before. And this, when I talk about work and experiences, is really where I like to focus. Has anyone heard of Moore's Law? Moore's Law basically states that every 18 months, the sophistication of technology doubles as its price halves, right? So we're seeing in microchips and, and, and USB sticks, and, and technology is really what it comes down to. Uh, technology is, is really doubling in the price it's having every 18 months. But going back to this Buckminster Fuller theory, there's a theory that came out that basically said, and we're going to have to follow along closely for a moment, that before the year 1900, the amount of information that we as people had access to doubled every 100 years. Okay? So that didn't mean you and I knew twice as much. It means we as, as, as humans knew twice as much every 100 years. So from the year 1700 to the 1800, we, we, knew twice, we, we knew twice as much. From 1800 to 1900, the amount of information that we had access to doubled again. From 19, and then after 1900, it doubled at a halved rate. So from 1900 to 1950, the amount of information that we had access to doubled. From 1950 to 75, it doubled again. From 75 to 88, it doubled again. From 88 to 93, it doubled again. To the point now, I was actually at a, speaking at a conference in, in Beverly Hills a couple years ago, um, where the creator of IBM supercomputer, Watson, we're familiar with Watson, the supercomputer, he was there, and he said the, the amount of information on the internet today, 90% of it was put there in the last two years which is pretty incredible. IBM is also saying now that the amount of information that we have access to is doubling every 13 months. So we're seeing this incredible increase of information. Now we're pairing artificial intelligence with machine learning, with robotics, and the amount of information that we have access to is doubling so fast that we can't even keep up. What we can keep up with, though, is the human connectivity piece that I think we all really are, are laying that foundation for as we're here. So pair this Incre incredible increase in the amount of information that we have access to with Moore's Law stating that every 18 months the sophistication of technology doubles as its price halves and all of a sudden we're living in a world that is increasingly misunderstood because it's moving so fast. So really, in five years, what I wanted to show you what, what has happened here. In five years, so this is, this is 2007 and this is, this is 2013. Now, when I first showed this picture, somebody asked me if this was like a Justin Bieber concert or something like that. And this is actually in St. Peter's Square to see the Pope, right? And so this technology we often like to attribute to being a, a, a Gen Z or a Gen Z or a millennial conversation. But truthfully, this technological conversation is true to all of us, regardless of, of which age we are. In fact, the fastest growing demographic on Facebook and Twitter right now are grandmothers which I thought was really interesting. Even Snapchat is on a decline now. Instagram is certainly on the increase, but it's just so f incredible to see how fast these technologies come into our lives and actually transform the way that we communicate, right? So, I mean, in five years, we're seeing this change. In 2016, Cisco put out a study that said we've entered the zettabyte era, and I had to Google it, right? I said, what, what's a zettabyte? And a zettabyte is 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000 megabytes. Pretty crazy, right? And actually, to put that into perspective, a zettabyte is the equivalent of 250 billion DVDs. Now, we can put that into perspective, but then my question back to you on this is, when was the last time you watched a DVD? A little while ago, right? It's all streaming, it's Netflix, it's Hulu, it's Grave, it's whatever it might be. It's, it's a little while. In fact, I went to a concert at Rogers just a, a few weeks ago. And Ticketmaster sent me a note. He said, hey, congratulations, you bought your tickets. With your ticket comes a free CD of the artist that you're going to see. <laughs> what do I do with that? Right? I don't even know a family member that I could send it to. Right? So I just didn't even reply and didn't take the album and then downloaded it on my streaming Spotify or Apple Music service uh, and had it before they could even put the stamp on the postage, like on, on the box. Right? And so <laughs> the, the point is that we're moving, we're moving really quick. And 
what I want to say about this too is that it's only a fraction of the speed that we're going to be moving. I mean, if we look at even data usage on our cell phones, I happen to be sitting at 10 gigs, and embarrassingly, I went just a little bit over last month. I had to top up, right? And I think we can all agree that some of us are there and some of us aren't. But the fact is, from 2014 to 2019, in just five years, we're seeing it anywhere from triple to 5x the amount of data that we're using on our cell phones. If we look at global internet traffic, <laughs> Back to 1992, we're using globally 100 gigabytes a day. Now, we're looking at in between 26,000 and 105,000 gigabytes a second, right? A second. And the question that I've got there is how much of it is noise and how much of it is quality information, right? And I think we have to be our own filters when we're looking at this. If you want to take a picture of that, I'll, I'll, yeah, go ahead. I just want to make sure you've got time. Yeah. Um, and so, when I look at this stuff, these, these numbers are fascinating. Obviously, things are happening very quickly. But then my question was, is like, okay, quickly in relation to what? So I started to look back and I said, like, okay, well, how long does it take to reach 50 million users? Telephone took 75 years. Internet took four years. Facebook, three and a half. Angry Birds, 35 days, right? What I thought was interesting is back in April, though, did anyone, anyone hear of um, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the yodeling kid? Did anyone see the yodeling kid in Walmart? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, some of us did and some of us didn't. But essentially, what I want to show you is, here, here he is. <laughs> so we don't have the signs, the, it, it hooked up obviously with sound. But then, uh, that was April 2nd. On April 13th, he was uh, at Coachella. <laughs> and he was doing his little yodeling song there for all of Coachella, which there's the audience. Oh my God. So that's how fast things happen. The thing, the thing about this is that, yeah, he was, he was in Coachella, but he also, the day before this, was uh, on the Ellen Show. Um, the, day, the, the, the day after this, he was playing at the Grand Ole Opry. And the weekend after this, he was playing at Stagecoach, the largest country music festival in North America. He now has two and a half million followers. His new song, I think, has three and a half million hits. And he hit 50 million people in about nine days. So we all have this potential of going viral, and this is what a real case study looks like of that being true. And so what I'm trying to say here is that the world is moving faster than, than we can keep up with. And that is proven to be true time and time again. The question then, though, is in a world that's increasingly connected, are we person to person connecting more and more or less and less? And that's not a question that I can answer for you. I think really that's a question that we can answer for ourselves though, right? So what I want to do is just a quick exercise because I find that when we look at the numbers, and we'll get into the numbers later, we spend a lot of time on our phones. I'm absolutely guilty, probably more than most. Uh, we spend a lot of time on our computers and our devices. And what I realize is we don't spend all that much time face to face. And at times, it can actually be a little bit uncomfortable. So what I'd like you to do, we're going to do a 30-second exercise. That's it. And after the 30 seconds, I think we'll feel a little bit different about connection. So what I'll ask you to do is, is to stand up and to pair up with somebody. Pair up with someone. So ideally, you want to be close enough to them that you can't smell their coffee breath, but far enough far enough away that you, you, can, you still want to see the whites in their eyes, is what it comes down to. So if you're right across the table, that's great. Um, cool. So we can look at me. Is anyone, does everyone know each other? Maybe a quick introduction. Yeah, everyone knows each other? OK. So what I want, and I, and I, need, your, I need your help for this one, um, and, and all I need for help is, is silence, or as close to silence as possible. But for 30 seconds, all we're going to do is to see each other for who we are. We don't have to say any words. In fact, I'd prefer that we didn't. If there's giggles or something, that's fine. But I really challenge you for 30 seconds to look at the other person in the eyes and see if you can actually see this person. See if you can feel their emotions and who they really are. So I've got my phone here. I'm going to time it just so that I know we're on the same page here. And I want to see what shows up. OK? So we can start in three, two, one, go. And as you're doing this, I want you to think of a couple things. Can, can, you, can you see what they're feeling? 
you think the person across from you can feel like your feeling? When's, when's the last time you've done this with someone before? Have you ever really done this before? Have, have you lost anyone recently? And what would you do to have this 30 seconds like this with that person again? Can that person feel your emotions even though you're not saying anything? Think of the most embarrassing thing that happened to you in the last week. What if that person across from you knew that? Let this sink in for a second. Is it getting more comfortable or more difficult? If you want to give the person across from you a hug or a handshake that's allowed, we can absolutely do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. So I apologize for lying. That wasn't 30 seconds. That was a, a few more seconds than that. But does, does, anyone, does anyone want to share sort of if they felt anything or saw anything or uh, what that experience was like for them? hyper-connected, instantaneous world right now. And regardless of who we are, when we're making that post, or whatever it is, it's always with us, right? And what I like most about this is in less than a minute, because even though it was a little more than 30 seconds, it was still less than a minute. You're right, the attention shifts. And all of a sudden, you want to feel like they trust the person that they were standing beside just a, a little bit more by the end of that, right? A little bit more, right? And it, you might not give them the keys to your house, but at the same time, <laughs> uh, at the same time, we've got this opportunity to connect on a on a deeper level. And I think that we're living in a time now where we've got so much accessibility to information that I could I could be on my phone and I could go from Facebook to Instagram to Pinterest to CBC to CNN to ABC to National Post to Globe and Mail to Snapchat, and then go back to the first source again. Facebook, I think I said first, yeah. and it'd be a whole new set of information, right? So I actually think that we know of more. We've got a broader scope, but we know in terms of depth a lot less. I find myself reading a headline to a, a news article and then forming an opinion and then relaying that opinion to either my friends or my network of some sort and realizing that I actually don't know anything about the story. right? And I think that when we look at the studies around this whole fake news conversation, the fake news conversation happens from people like me who don't have an educated opinion or have an understanding as to what the story is, create an opinion on something that wasn't true in the first place, and then we play this large game of telephone until it evolves into something that was not even close to what it really was in the first place. In fact, it, during the presidential election in 2016, you know, you get the right or left wing papers that would run a different title in Seattle than they would in Atlanta. That because people don't make it past the headlines, and so you can make you can form an opinion based on what this headline stands for. And so my challenge to you as we move forward, whether it's in your personal career, or in, your, in, your professional, in your personal life or your professional career, is to take the time to connect. And I don't mean click a button on LinkedIn or Facebook or follow somebody. I mean take the time to have a conversation. Take the time to go take somebody for coffee. And it doesn't have to be an hour or two hours or three hours. 
maybe it's 30 seconds, right? But I think in a world that's busier than it's ever been before, where we think we've got this paradox of choice, where there's endless opportunities, I think that real opportunities that'll be best fit for us are the ones that we actually seek out and explore at a deeper level. Because using my case study as an example, I tried to send out 60 different resumes and got no response. Now I can send out an email and really say, hey, can we jump on a quick five minute call and I just wanna ask you a couple quick questions and get a bit of a feel as to what that experience is. People very, very rarely turn you down, especially when you take that extra effort to really get to know them on a more personal level. Any questions so far? Cool. Yeah. How do you how do you mix the the, the, the mind with whatever your intuition is about how to connect with people? How do you flow in this even like let alone the the electronic technology world? Yeah. Like if you go to one one networking event mm -hmm. every day in Vancouver, which there are like three happening. Yeah. So uh, how do you flow with the with, with whom to connect? share that time and then so on and so on and there could be 300 people there yeah. to know. Hey, well first of all, great question. I appreciate you asked that. Um, when I first moved here three years ago, I knew one one person uh, and I came from, from Calgary, which is you know not all that far away, but I, I knew one person I happened to be living with too. I went to, to university with him. And uh, what I asked him to do, because you know he knew me fairly well, is can you connect me with three people that I could just take out for coffee? Right? Just three people. I don't want to sell them anything. You know, it's not, there's nothing entrepreneurial about this. I just want to get to know people. Because uh, he knew me and he knew his network and here's three people that I could get along with. Uh, when I finished the coffee or conversation with those people, I asked them, can you introduce me to two people that you think I'd get along with at each coffee? Right? And by the end of it, now I've got a network of hundreds of people here. Some of them I do business with, some of them I don't, some of them I'm friends with on a regular basis, some of them I'm not at all. And you start to develop a, a network really quick. My, my favorite networking tip, though, um, when, when you go to a networking event, if you've got business cards or whatever that might be, I only bring five. And if I, if I give out more than five, personally, it means I haven't connected with them on a deep enough basis, right? Because when I first started to network, I had this like, back pocket bulging with business cards, and it was almost like I was giving away coupons, you know, at the dinner. It's like, here, take this, here, come on it, and, it, and it, it, did, it didn't work. Because people didn't even know who I was. It was just this card, and at the end of this sea of cards, I didn't stand out because nobody knew who I was in the first place. And so, you know, they say, in entrepreneurship or otherwise, that an overnight success takes a thousand days. And I think in a world that's moving faster than it ever has before, Patience, persistence, and consistency are the three words that we all need to gravitate to. Yeah. So I'll give you another example. Um, in November of last year, uh, I, I'm not a runner by any means. And uh, so I went for a run. It was three and a half kilometers, and I was quite exhausted. And right after that, we decided, a few friends and I, to sign up for a half Ironman. And a half Ironman is a two-kilometer swim a 90 kilometer bicycle ride, and then a 21 kilometer run. And we finished that in June. And then on the weekend, we just did a 166 kilometer bike ride in Bellingham, it was a Fondo. And what I realized is that whether you're networking or building relationships or starting a company or doing anything in the athletic side of things, persistence, resiliency, and consistency are the three things that will ultimately get us to wherever we wanna go. Because whenever we're spending time trying to better ourselves, um, in perpetuity, without stopping, it's, it, it all of a sudden takes any sort of competitive, comparative angle that we have in the world and, and flips it internally, right? And I think that that's the biggest mistake that I used to make too, is how am I comparing to other peers that are on the speaking circuit or entrepreneurs? Am I competing with them? And what my realization was is I'm really only competing or comparing myself to the person in the mirror and the person that I was yesterday. Because what we don't understand often is that we're playing two different, two completely different games, right? Even if I'm another speaker, even if there's another speaker in here, and we handed both of us the exact same script, we would have a different audience, right? We'd have a different objective, we'd have a different goal. And so to suggest that you're competing against anyone for a job or to get that grant, really, I think is wasted time. Because if we can be a better version of ourselves today than we were yesterday, and a better version of ourselves tomorrow than we were today, that's all we can do.
and all of a sudden all the pressure is alleviated from ourselves and, and comparing ourselves to the world around us, which is so good at what social media pins us against doing, and all of a sudden it becomes a lot more effortless. So back to your networking, I just think that instead of trying to meet as many people as possible and trying to get it right the first time, make one really solid connection and let that person refer you to a couple other people that you might be good fits with, and then all of a sudden that room of 300, maybe that individual knows 70 of them, and say, hey, why don't you go talk to this person over here, you guys might have a lot in common, all of a sudden that room gets a lot smaller quite quickly. Any other questions for now? Cool. So what I wanted to do is, is take this back. In the 90s, a study was done to see how many, how many people can we actually follow? How many people can we keep track of, really? And the study came back to say that we can only really have five best friends. We can only have 10 close friends, which we know most things about, uh, and we can have 35 acquaintances. We can really, we can track about another 100, or about another 100 people just to sort of see, yeah, they got married, yeah, I understand they, you know, maybe had a kid, or they moved. That's pretty much what we know about them. But the problem is, is that when we look at today's day and age, the number of Facebook friends that we have on average is 338, right? The number of emails that we get is 121, and the hours, average hours that we're working a week is 47. And so I said it before, but I'll say it again. When we try and be everything to everyone, we ultimately become nothing to anyone, right? And I think the biggest problem with social media today is that it's pulling us to appease to and make so many people happy that we're always feeling like we have to climb this uphill battle. What I would suggest we do is to strip the numbers from here and just focus on these deeper connections because we know that especially in this case, quality is far better than quantity, right? The other thing that I'll say is that workplace loneliness and the speed of evolution that this is happening, I mean, Facebook just came out 12 years ago. We look at the iPhone launch 11 years ago. I mean, 11 years ago, this thing, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the capabilities of these things is, is vastly different. The gig economy, we're looking at remote work, flexible work, the idea of um, co-working spaces. We're, we're only talking nine years ago, right? And so when we look at the number of times we check our phones a day, 85 times a day. We spend three and a half hours a day on our phones, and we spend 10 hours a day in front of a screen, right? So it comes back to this connection piece. Who are we connecting with? And how much time and effort are we putting into screens versus in-person relationships? And again, I don't have an answer for you. I just want to let you know that this is the world that we're living in. And sometimes to stand out, let me put it this way. What I like to say about human connection, the, the fastest way that we can speed up human connection is to slow down. The fastest way we can learn more about ourselves is to slow down. And it just so happens that in this beautiful city with a seawall that's there, with the gross mountain that's right there, that to take the time to go for a walk without headphones, without a cell phone attached to us, is incredibly powerful. Yeah. And we're lucky to be living in a place that allows us to do that, right? But Harvard Business Review said that today over 40% of adults in America report feeling lonely and, re and research suggests the real number may be well higher. Additionally, the number of people who report having a close confidant in their lives have been declining over the past few decades. In the workplace, many employees and half the CEOs report feeling lonely in their roles. Right. This loneliness is actually pretty serious stuff. I mean, the loneliness, that feeling of loneliness is worse than the smoke that was in the sky last week. <laughs> I think that was seven or eight cigarettes being outside. Yeah. Being lonely is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So if you're lonely and you're outside last week, you're in trouble. I mean, I'll just say that. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, even some of the things that we're talking about today, just in terms of slowing down and making fewer but more meaningful uh, connections, is, uh, is really important. The whole notion of work, when we look at the evolution of how this path is going, is changing too. We're moving from work-life balance to more work-life integration. Work-life balance suggests that you can do one thing and then the other in their equilibrium, right? We're living in a world now where we can be at the, at the soccer field watching someone play and doing an email. You know, you can be at the spaghetti pot at dinner, stirring our pasta, and you can, you know, be on a conference call. In fact, my dad came up to me last week and he said, hey, Eric, I'm going to try something new. I said, what's that, dad? He said, I'm going to try putting my phone... Uh, away before I go to bed, an hour before I go to bed, and I'm not going to pick it up until an hour after I wake up. He said, I'm actually losing so much of my day due to this thing that I want some connection with my family and my friends again. And, you know, I thought that was, first of all, really admirable, but shocking to hear uh, from an older individual, right? The fact that he's recognized that he's losing a lot of the connection with his friends due to his cell phone just because he's so integrated with work that it's harder to put down. 
And truthfully, work is a bigger identifier than it ever has been before. It's not a nine to five transactional experience. It's something that's much greater. If we took work back even 15 years ago, we all had a very similar schedule, right? We slept, we got up, we made breakfast, we showered, we drove 24 minutes according to Stats Canada to work. We worked, we had lunch, transit, whatever that might be. Maybe you go home for lunch, come back to work, uh, then you're maybe watching the news in the newspaper, playing sports, doing something, uh, and then you prep for the next day and go to sleep, and then you're back to sleep. That's essentially what our days look like. Everything from the Industrial Revolution on. The truth is, is that's not where we're at right now. We're at a point where we can work any time we wake up to pretty much any time we go to sleep, right? Even if you're a shift worker, you can come home and it's on your mind, you can do a little email, you're connected to work, right? And so when I look at this, I woke up at 2 in the morning last night. What's the first thing I did? I checked my phone to see if there's an email. Like somebody's going to be sending me an email at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> and I'm still connected to it. And so something I'm working on is now I bought an alarm clock, 10 bucks, <laughs> that sits on my bedside table and this thing stays out in a different room. It actually, studies are showing now that we're smarter when their phone is in a different room. I mean, uh, there was a, a speaker that I was talking to last week. He's, he said that he went out for dinner with 10 people and uh, they, four of them pulled their phone out to calculate what the tab was when they split it divided by 10. You know? Pretty crazy, right? That we can't just, you know, move. Anyways, uh, the fact is, is that work is more encompassing of who we are than it's ever been before. So identifying what that fit for us is, is more important than it's ever been before too, right? So whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're looking for a job, I think it's safe to say that finding this right fit is so important. In fact, when we look at the, at the, the priorities, we're looking at culture, purpose-driven organizations, right? When we look at wage, wages in terms of importance of the job, it's sitting at number four in terms of priorities in North America right now. And so the question then is, what does, it mean, what does culture fit mean, right? What does it mean to be aligned with these organizations? When we look at freelancers, 36% of the population right now is freelancing. By 2027, that number will be greater than 50. So freelancing might not mean full-time, but it might be doing some sort of side hustle or freelancing part-time. And so proactively, I think what we need to be doing is to be telling a better story, right? From ourselves personally and the organizations that we're working for. Who's uh, opening up a, a cafe? Looking at a cafe? Yeah, great. And I applaud you for that. That's awesome. The question that I would ask you in terms of your culture and the story that you're going to be telling to attract people is how do you differ from a J.J. Bean, from a Cafe Artigiano? from uh, blends, from waves. And the truth is, is there's no right answer. There's your answer, right? And what you stand for and the experience that you're going to have for these people and what life they want to live as a result of the job that they have working for you, that's not a disadvantage in any way. There's no way that you can spin that. That's only positive. And so what I like to say is sometimes the things that we're not are what make us what we are on a personal level and a professional level. So if, if Waves or Blends has some sort of program or perk or benefit and you don't, use that as an advantage, not a disadvantage. Because what I've found is that so many companies are saying, how do we imitate, how do we be like Google, like Facebook, like Netflix, you know, like Instagram? How do we be like these companies? And again, when we try and be everything to everyone, we end up being nothing to anyone. And so if we can understand our differentiating components and really leverage them on a personal basis too, right? If you're not someone who likes remote or flex work and you want to be in the office with your people, awesome. That's an advantage, not a disadvantage. Yeah. If you can't do the cubicle experience and you want to be in an open office concept or you want to have, you know, you want to get the pens out and start writing on whiteboards and being creative with your team, understand that about yourself. And so what I like to say is that if what I like to do, um, and, and we can do this on our own time, but what I would challenge you to do after this is to, is to take a pen and paper and just write uh, a T-chart in the middle and write 10 things that you must have in order in, in every day to make, make it a successful day. Maybe it's a cup of coffee in the morning. Maybe it's to go for a run. Maybe it's to you know, call your, your loved one or to see your loved one. 10 simple things that you must have in order to make every day successful. And on the flip side, I would say, what are 10 things that the day can't have? right? And what are the 10 things that you want to stay away from? And when we can understand ourselves better, and we can tell a better story about who we are, then all of a sudden we redefine what it means to be successful. I think we've all heard of the American dream here, and I think the American dream is the most ridiculous way of saying that that's how we should strive to be successful. American dream promotes this one, for some, idealistic 
pinnacle of success, and for others, not at all, right? So instead of looking at, let's just say, the Canadian dream, what I'd like to suggest is that maybe instead of having one Canadian dream, there are about 36 million Canadians' dreams, right? Each one of them being unique, each one of them being special to the individual who actually has that dream of accomplishing that goal. And I think when we look at what those non-starters are to make us happy, to make us feel fulfilled, which ultimately are giving us those A's on the energy charts and not the C's, that I think that we can start to gravitate towards experiences that will allow us to have as much energy as possible uh, and ultimately not be depleted as fast as we think. And so the, what I'd like to say to companies is that an optimized culture is one where the stated and the realized experiences are the same. So often we'll go to companies and we'll say, here are our mission, vision, values. And then we go to the staff and say, what's it like to work here? And they don't say anything like this. There's a big problem, right? But if the mission, vision, values match what an employee would say their experience is here, and I think that's what a big opportunity is for that cafe is to co-create what those mission, vision, values are, so that they're not empty statements, but they actually mean something to the people that are there, and they can really gravitate to what they stand for in the wall, that's when we're going to get optimized. And truthfully, somebody at a cafe may love your experience and hate the experience at Waves. That's okay. You've, it just means you've attracted the right people, right? You've told the right story. And so when I look at culture, I think this conversation is absolutely fascinating because it's messy, right? I actually looked at what are the components of cultures, just Googled it. And here's what I came up with. All right, just take a look at this for a second. All of these things are important. Some, of them are, some people are going to find them more important than others. Other people are going to find, you know, hiring, compensation, uh, philosophies, management, holidays, start time, training hours, compensation. All of these are going to be really important to a lot of people and some more important to others. So culture is this really messy topic that I think we all like to talk about. And really what I like to say is, like, how do we actually make it simple? So what I want to do, if I can just turn this off, I'm just going to use this whiteboard for a second. Okay. I've been, I've been trying, to, trying to make, uh-oh, turning off, okay. So what I've been trying to do is to make, um, make culture simple, right? And so what I found is that if we were to have this terribly drawn matrix, one second, let's try that again. <laughs> To do is to, is to try and simplify culture a little bit. And I went on the 50 most engaged place, 50 most engaged companies in North America. I looked at the 100 best places to work. And I started to see, okay, well, is there any correlation between how, ooh, that's exciting, between how engaged companies are and the experience they have at work? And so my girlfriend, for example, she works at, at Lululemon. And Lululemon, in, in, their, in their contracts, while it's not a must, they suggest that you don't work more than 40 hours a week. As you know, they're a very community-involved uh, organization. They value work-life balance. They value family. So Lulu, I would say they spend about 20 to 25 hours a week in meetings. It's a meeting-intense organization, highly collaborative. They work a lot together. And they really value not working more than 40 hours a week. Now you take another collaborative organization, like, like Google, for example, you might be working 60 hours a week at Google. Very collaborative, uh, lots of open spaces where you can come together and get things done. And, and they might sit here. Now, looking over on, on this side of things, I was looking at Allstate. Everyone familiar with Allstate, the insurance company? Allstate, nine to five organization. They largely work with clients independently. They're on the phones, they're hammering the lines, they're doing everything by themselves, and they sit about here. A lot of remote and flexible software designers are going to be very not collaborative at all because they're by themselves. Maybe they'll work a little bit more or less depending on the experience that the companies have for them. But then up here, what I like to say is Amazon, I think Tesla would sit here. They're not very collaborative organizations, and they work a ton. I mean, Tesla now, especially in their retail side of things, they're on a commission base. So they're fairly dog-eat-dog, -dog, and they'll climb over each other to get the sale done, right? And so when I looked, though, at engagement, and I looked at workplace satisfaction, 
there's not one company that's really doing better than the others. All of them are doing really well. In fact, when you look at the best places to work in America in 2018, Salesforce is number one. Number two is Wegmans. Wegmans is a food like a grocery mart, much like Safeway or Savon, right? They pay $7.25 an hour. The average salary at Salesforce is just north of $120,000, right? Totally different environments, totally different experiences. And the problem is, for anyone who's looking for that fulfilling job, we think that, okay, all these companies are on the most engaged list. I'm going to apply to all of them. The thing that we're not looking at, though, is saying, well, what is the experience like when we're there, right? Because if I'm an introvert who wants to be doing something by myself, who's not really in, a, in an open office concept where dogs are rolling around, where the World Cup is playing on this TV and music is playing on the other TV, then maybe something on the not-so-collaborative side is where I want to be, and that's okay. Maybe I'm somebody who hates emails, who hates getting on the phone, who, who really wants to be in, in a group setting, getting out that whiteboard, getting my hands dirty, rolling up my sleeves, and working with a team. Maybe this is where I want to be. Maybe I've got a two-year-old at home. Maybe here's what I want to be. Maybe I'm 22 and want nothing more than to make as much money as possible and put work before anything else. Maybe here's where I want to be. So what I'm getting at is that a universal best culture doesn't exist. But a best culture for you and I certainly does. The problem here is that when we go online, and when we look at these job postings, and we look at the job descriptions, and we look at the best places to work lists, or best managed, to com best managed companies lists, we don't see this, right? So we talk about belonging, and I intentionally do that first. We talk about belonging and connection, because the first thing that I do, the first thing that a lot of my peers did, is we'll go online. We'll go on LinkedIn, we'll go on Monster, we'll go on Indeed, and we'll look for these jobs, and we'll find terrible job descriptions that don't at all talk about these things, and just apply because we like the brand name, right? Well, I think what I would do instead, and I worked with a couple people in doing this, is to go and look for the job that you're trying to apply for. I'll do this later. Look for the job that you're trying to apply for. Go on LinkedIn and see somebody who's already in that position and reach out. Just say, hey, I'm wondering if I could just have a 15-minute chat with you. I'm not asking for anything. I'm not looking for an introduction. I'm just looking to understand what's your experience like at work. Is it 9 to 5? Is it 6 to 6? Is it 6 to 10? Is it or is it not? Because as we mentioned, a universal best culture doesn't exist, but one that's best for you or for me certainly does. And I think the more we can understand about what that optimal experience is for us, the better story that we can tell even the recruiter too. Because hey, I just talked to Steven on your team. I, I knew that he was in the uh, uh, marketing department. That's where I want to be. What I learned about your job is this, this, and this. I know that aligns with what I'm looking for, because of this, this, and this. Yeah? Do you think Glassdoor is doing something like this? That, that you can evaluate the company and maybe provide this digital experience because you're not going to get in touch with the employee? I think Glass Glass Glassdoor is, is touching on this. But the problem, in, again, in this is that Glassdoor will be really good at rating what the job or what the position is. But we have no idea how we compare to that individual. Because you might find Salesforce to be the best environment, five stars, love my manager, love my boss, and you and I have totally different working styles. So until we can understand from that person, well, what's your life, what time did you wake up this morning? Because I was 5.30, maybe you were 7, right? What time are you going to bed tonight? 9.30, maybe 11, right? What do you like to do in your spare time? What does this job enable you to do? What is your management style? What are all of these things that I think are really important to ask to know that, okay, great. These sort of arbitrary, I mean, the, the analogy that I would say is when you go to a restaurant, you look at, at, um, at Yelp or something like that, right, to see how the food is. Well, I mean, I might not be very good with spicy food, and other people that rated that restaurant might just love it, love it, love it, love it, and I get there, and I can't eat anything, you know? So I just think that these ratings are so subjective that until we take the actual time to understand what that experience is like, then I think we can, we can get to the root of it. So I talked about, a little bit about this. Um, culture versus best culture, I actually don't think a best culture exists. Because when we look at the Fortune 100, Weg Salesforce is number one and Wegmans is number two, right? My guess is that somebody who's working at Salesforce wouldn't want to work at Wegmans all that much, right? And somebody who's working at Wegmans probably wouldn't want to work at Salesforce all that much, right? And so again, understanding the experience in these companies has never been more important. Actually, three years ago, Amazon was just getting ripped apart <laughs> by the New York Times. They worked 
long hours. They were 14, they were for 14 hours. There were tears. There was just like nobody was happy. Well, it turns out it's just that the person that wrote that article didn't think that, that was a very good work environment because that's not an environment that worked well for them. It turns out that their Glassdoor score at the time was 3.4 to 5. Now it's even better, 3.8. And of the 19,000 employees, 74% of them would rec their, recommend their company to a friend. And what we know about negative comments like this is that you get about five times as many negative comments as you do positive. So what I'd like to suggest is this number is actually way higher. What did Amazon do different? Nothing. They were really intentional about the people that they wanted to attract. They were really good at telling that story about what the expectations are in that environment. And they brought people who wanted to put work first. Now that might be bad for you and I. We might find that to be a toxic environment that we want nothing to do with. And I think Amazon is doing a really good job at detracting us from applying there because they're being really transparent about what that experience is. I think the organizations who try to mask and hide the things that they're not proud of are the ones that are attracting the worst people, not because they're not skilled, not because they're not good workers, but because they don't align with the environment that's ultimately created. And so for us who are looking for jobs, the more we can understand about ourselves and the environment that we're looking for, the people that we want to connect with, pair that with the skills that we've got, the better off we're going to be in finding that ultimate employment that's best for us. Any questions? Perfect. So the line that I think keeps coming up is we always heard the grass is greener on the other side. I, I kind of disagree. The grass is greener wherever it's watered, right? And so often we've got this idea that because the world is so busy and so noisy, we keep looking for new opportunities. When we're in a situation that we enjoy, when we're in a relationship that we're happy with, we don't look for anything outside of it, right? And because this world has so much information in it, companies are so good at advertising what the perks of the organization are, we're led to falsely believe that that's what the experience is like too. I mean, Vancouver Tech is guilty of that, I would say more so than anyone else. We've got a ping pong table, we've got a beer keg, it's going to be fun here. We've got an open office concept. What if you don't drink, you can't play ping pong, and you do better working by yourself, right? I think the entire recruiting process inherently favors the extroverted individual who likes to you know, goof around quite a bit. And the truth is that there are so many opportunities that will enable you to be the best that you want to be because you want to be there, not because you feel like they have to be there, that it just takes a little bit of extra legwork in understanding who we are and the experiences that we're looking for and having those conversations with people who are already in those positions that once we find there's alignment with them, more doors open as a result. The other thing that I like to talk about is, um, is generations. And this is kind of how I got my start in speaking because I'm a millennial. And if you've read the newspapers in the last decade, it means that uh, I'm narcissistic, I'm job hopping, I'm not loyal, I'm a basement dwelling, Netflix watching, Xbox playing individual that sort of like sucks the life from my parents, right? And just asks for as much money as possible. And uh, when I look at these generalizations to generations, it, it got a little bit frustrating, right? Because we keep getting labeled and pinned as something that perhaps we are or we aren't. There are two sides to look at this generational conversation, too, if we read the newspapers. One is that the, this generation doesn't put their phone down. They, all, they, don't, they don't stop working. They don't take holidays. They don't take sick days. They'll do whatever it takes to get it done. They've got a side hustle that they're doing for the other hours of the day. They work through the night. And then you get the opposite, right? Which is what I said before. And the truth is, is this happens with every generation. There's not really any difference in terms of what these generations are saying. that I'll say is that this generational conversation is not new. I mean, we have it every 10 or 15 years. I mean, we went from traditionalists to boomers to Gen X to, to Gen Y to Gen Z to what I would call the battery generations, maybe Gen A, double AA, A, triple A, you know, whatever, whatever comes next. I don't know. The time cover hasn't come out yet. But what I want to, to, to stress is that this conversation, it's not new, right? Here's a quote that I want to show you. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. Does anyone know whose quote this is? This is a Socrates quote. So a little older than any of us in the room by you know a couple thousand years. This one is a little bit more wordy. Uh, but today, suddenly, because all the peoples of the world are part of one electronically based intercommunicating network, young people everywhere share a kind of experience that none of the elders ever had or will have. Conversely, the older generation will never see repeated in the lives of young people their own unprecedented experience of sequentially emerging change. 
this breakthrough between this break between generations is wholly new, planetary, and universal. This one is going to be a little bit tougher, perhaps, but the point is that it came from Margaret Mead in 1969. 1969 is when the, the, the shuttle went to the moon, obviously. And um, the computers that took that spaceship to the moon, uh, there were two 68 kilobyte computers on board. An iPhone 5 has 250,000 times the computing power <laughs> that those computers that took us to the moon did. And so this generational conversation, I think, is really funny because really what this is saying is that as we age, we know less and less about the people that are coming after us. And I think especially in the world that we're living in today, a lot of that is, tech, is technology related. So I look at this, and there's one more article that I want to share with you. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Essentially, enough is enough. As a blank, I'm fed up with the ceaseless carping of a handful of spoiled, self-indulgent, overgrown adolescents. Blank may like to call themselves the why me generation, but they should be called the whiny generation. If I remove the blanks, as a baby boomer, I'm fed up with the ceaseless carping of a handful of spoiled, self-indulgent, overgrown adolescence generation. Xers may like to call themselves the whiny generation, but they should be called the whiny generation. It, uh, it gets worse or funnier, depending on your perspective. But um, this is just something I, I wanted to, to show you, to show again that this conversation around generations isn't new. right? In fact, this actually came out October 31st of 1993 in Newsweek. So when I look at this, uh, there's one more little uh, video that I want to show you. It's not new. Again, this, that's Bill Gates. And this was for the Windows 1995 launch. And so we like to think that this next generation loves technology more than anyone else. I think we just have more access to it. So I'll, I'll leave that for now. But that's uh, yeah, a little painful to watch, and we don't have enough time to watch the whole thing. Um, but then the next thing is, you know, millennials like to think that this is how the world is being handed over to them. Kind of something like that. <laughs> really quick and really painful. Um, but, you know, I just had to throw that in there. Because what I wanted to suggest and what I wanted to ask is that we've got a problem, I think, with how we label and generalize people. If I were to ask between what years uh, are millennials born, what would you suggest? I'm just putting this out to the group. Any suggestions? 91 to, what was that? 80 to 97. Anyone else? We need a couple more guesses. I don't know that I'm not 83, 93? Yeah, one more? More or less? One, maybe one more guess? What do you think? 90s to 2000. 90s to 2000. And, and so, just for consistency's sake, I like to say 80 to 1995. I'm no more right than you, and to prove that point, I had to ask my pal Wikipedia. I do some pretty serious research when I'm doing my talks. And uh, we, actually, we actually mapped this out, so we've got a timeline here. Uh, and what it shows is that there's no consistency at all in terms of how we generalize this group. So you might be right in what you said, I might be right in what I said, you might be right in what you said. But we're talking like MetLife, Nielsen Media Research, PwC, Gallup, Ernst & Young, Pew Research, um, Goldman Sachs, United States Census Bureau, the Dictionary, all group these individuals as something totally different. In Canada, if we looked at 1980, to 1995, we're talking 21% of the Canadian population, 7.5 million people. And so anytime we group that large of a cohort together based on nothing more than age, we're going to be really right a lot of the times about what they value, what they need, what they want, what they expect. But at the same time, we're going to be just as wrong, right? Because if we read any of these articles, 10 ways to engage with millennials, 10 ways to communicate with millennials, have anyone read those and be like, yeah, that's, that's what I want too. I mean, nothing's really new here. In fact, what I like to say is that people don't change uh, from generation to generation, but the world around us does. And we talked about that too. We talked about how fast the world is moving. We talked about the knowledge doubling curve and really how things are changing. So when we look at these generations, really it's a fairly new concept. We looked at tradi traditionalists, boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, right? But I actually think it's bigger than that. The conversation is bigger than that. And funny enough, just last year, I was reading a Fast Company or Business Insider magazine, and they said, make room for the Zennials. I said, what the heck is a Zennial? And so a Zennial is somebody who felt that they were too old to be a millennial or a Gen Y, and too young to be a Gen Xer, so we combined the two and gave them their own club, right? Because nobody wants to be left out. Let's get serious. But that's just it. 
What I found these are nothing more than clubs. Because we talked about this. We talked about belonging. We talked about values. We talked about understanding who we are. The research actually shows now that there's, there's only a 10% correlation in terms of what we value based on our age. If we were to group, if we were to take a thousand people and we were to group all of the creatives, regardless of their age, regardless of their sex, regardless of their experience, we took all people who self-identified to be creative, we would be eight times more likely to align what their values, wants, needs, and expectations are than we were if we were to group a thousand people that were just boomers. Right? So if we can understand the life that we want to live, the things that we value, want, need, and expect, then we can actually align ourselves with people regardless of our age, sex, ethnicity, background, anything, because we speak the same language deep down. That's what it comes down to. And so the point that I want to make here to really sort of just ideally abolish the whole idea of generations is that if technology is changing at an unprecedented rate, then what I would say is the time span a generation occupies should actually shrink. So if you remember before, we talked about Buckmaster Foley's knowledge doubling curve. The amount of information we have access to doubles at a halved rate. Well, I would suggest that the time span a generation occupies should actually shrink at an inverse rate to the, to, to the rate the technology is being integrated into the world that we live in. Do you get it? Does anyone understand? Because I would say that when we look at the, at, let's just say in the, in the back of a car. When I grew up in the back of a car, I was reading a book like I'm sure most of us were. My younger brother had a Game Boy. My younger cousin had a PlayStation Portable. Then there were screens on the back of the car. Then the screens are gone. Then the fold down one in the middle. And then that was gone. And now all of a sudden we're on our 4G LTE phones playing an app against someone driving down Highway 1 going out to Mission um, playing Mario Kart. <laughs> Times have changed really quickly. And when we try and understand people based solely on their age and suggest that we grew up in different worlds and value different things, that's not necessarily true. Now, am I saying that the world is not different between someone who's 80 and 18? No, I mean, we fundamentally grew up in different worlds. But does that mean that those people value different things? Not at all. What I found is that, again, people don't change from generation to generation, but the world around us, it really does. It used to be that we got a pat on the back when we did a good job, right? Now it might be a text, or it might be an email, or it might be a double tap on some sort of screen. So again, Things are changing fast, and when we look at this, this suggests that generations were never a good way of classifying or categorizing people. And so when we're looking for that job, we're look, you know, it's not about hiring millennials or digital natives or Gen Zs or Gen Zs or whoever that might be. It's about attracting a value set. And I think the better we can define and understand what our value set is, the easier it's going to be to tell our stories to a prospective employer. Then we get into the job description, and we talked about this before, around understanding you know, how at times useless these job descriptions are. I took one of the Fortune 500 companies, oil and gas, in Calgary, Alberta, just earlier this year, and I looked at this one-page job description. Now, you don't need to read what it says. I know it's probably pixelated anyways. But essentially, it was skills, experience, skills, conditions. It didn't at all talk about the experience. How do we possibly know how that differentiates? If we wanted to be in accounting or consulting, how do we know the difference between Deloitte and PwC and Ernst & Young and KPMG? You know, if we're at a golf course, how do we know the difference between McCleary, between Fraserview, between uh, Langara, without actually being there to understand it, right? When we look at the scorecard, they're all par 72s. But the, the layout and that experience is vastly different. It's one that we don't really get. Then, too, if we look at just in Toronto, at Human Resources Administrators, there are 2,209 different positions. How are we to possibly know the one that's going to be right fit for us? And so I think the better we can understand who we are, the experience that we're looking for, and the values that seep through that experience, the better we'll be at sorting out which one of these opportunities is going to be best for us. Ultimately, how do we know? I think we get on the phone or we start sending emails to say, what is your experience like? And if you want, I've got a set of questions that we can ask that I'm happy to email out after that I think are good starting questions to understand what that experience is like. And again, there's no universal best experience, but there is for us, right? There's an environment that we would do best in. The other thing that I found out, and if you're going through applicant tracking systems, I would suggest trying it if you really want to beat the system. But I was reading in The Guardian um, just last month that uh, there's an algorithm beating trick that people are using. I'm going to use this to show you. But in the white spaces with white text, 
people are putting words like Harvard, Yale, Oxford, 4.0 GPA, and using these words to trick the applicant tracking system. So when they're printed out after they beat the system, nobody can actually see the text that's there. <laughs> Pretty crazy, right? And so there are so many ways to game this system that once you're in, really, it's going to come down to the interview anyways. And so I just wanted to show you because people are doing this. And I think there's a better way around it. I actually don't think your resume should be your entry document. I think it should be the follow-up document because you've done the work, you've understood the environment and the experience, and you know that, hey, okay, I'm going to be really intentional about the resume because I know about the company that I want to work for and who I want to work with. I know that this environment at least has a good shot at being a good fit for me. What else I found is that perks attract talent and experience keeps it. I think a lot of us gravitate to the job postings that talk about the open office concept or the Flex Friday in the summer or you know the dog that's running around or the PlayStation that we have in the lunchroom or the free food. And I think perks are, are really important. It means that the company cares about their people in their way. But don't get lured into a, an experience that's not right for you. Because truthfully, that's not right for either individual. And I think that's where some of the problems lie. Right? So I think instead, if we can shift this job description to something more wholesome, and I think that even if you were to start adding video and start talking about who you were in this, in this job description and adding a little bit more meat to it, what you like to do instead of just like, avid hiker or likes board games or something like that, add a little bit of yourself to this. I think we've, we're, we're better off. So really what I think it comes down to is I think we need to be talking about who people are and not what people are. We've talked so much about age, about sex, about ethnicity, about different generations, and not about what we value and what we experience. Because we've found that the correlation between values and experiences and environments and how we thrive in them are far greater than aligning people based just on age or sex. Right. I'll just wait if you want to take a photo of that, that's great. Um, and finally, uh, engagement. I think engagement is a really interesting topic because engagement for so long, people have thought that engagement is what we fix. I actually think engagement is a byproduct of what we fix. How do you fix engagement? You don't. You fix the things that contribute to engagement and overall the aggregate of engagement uh, changes. So while we're here, culture is not what we fix. Culture is the result of the work that we do. If I were to ask Somebody, what is what is culture fit? Does anyone have an idea or an answer? I mean, I, I can't really answer it. We've been talking about culture fit for a decade, right? What is what is that? An alignment of values? Well, the problem is if you value integrity, honor, respect, motivation, team-driven, highly communicative players, yeah. there's nobody who's not going to self-identify as someone who's like that.